Hi there, it's Friday the 19th of July 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. Following this week's G7 Finance Ministers meeting in France, we now know three things on digital taxation. Firstly, the G7 members support the global minimum tax proposal in Pillar 2, although the minimum tax rate has not yet been agreed. Also, it looks like the US guilty regime might be the intended model, which would suggest that the calculation would be done on an aggregate basis, not on a per country basis. Secondly, the US's preferred Pillar 1 proposal involving marketing intangibles seems to have secured the support of the other G7 countries. And thirdly, France is not backing down in regard to its proposed DST, despite US threats. Although the French finance minister emphasised that the DST will be repealed as soon as a global solution is secured. For a copy of the chair's summary of the G7 meeting, please go to our website or app. An EU advisory body, the European Economic and Social Committee, has issued a paper which recommends the use of four factors to allocate residual profits – assets, sales, labour and R&D. For a copy of this paper, please go to our website or app. The OECD has launched the Stage 1 Dispute Resolution Peer Review process for 10 more jurisdictions, its ninth batch. Taxpayers are invited to make comments on the MAP process in these jurisdictions by completing a questionnaire by the 12th of August. As many of the jurisdictions are tax havens, I can expect few comments to be made. However, if you do want to complete the questionnaire, please go to our website or app. The final version of the OECD's guidance on the transfer pricing treatment of financial transactions will not mandate how countries should deal with the debt versus equity characterization issue, according to a US IRS official. Instead, the characterization issue will be left to each country to work out under its own tax law. This reflects the fact that a common approach cannot be agreed due to variations in the tax law of OECD member countries. The IRS official also said that the guidance will not be issued for several more months. And the OECD has released its 2019 edition of its Going for Growth report, which reviews structural reform priorities in 46 OECD and non-member countries. Environmental sustainability is a key aspect of this year's report. For your copy of the report, please go to our website or app. In Australia, the tax authorities have been forced by legislation to reach a different tax conclusion for licensed taxis versus ride-sharing services such as Uber. The specific issue is an exemption from fringe benefits tax for travel between home and work. Employers which pay for such travel for employees will be entitled to an FBT exemption only if the travel is in licensed taxis. No exemption is available if the travel is via a ride-sharing service. 
a change to the legislation will be required to remove this anomaly. In Bangladesh, legislation implementing the 2019 budget has been enacted. The legislation reflects some changes to two significant budget proposals, which are designed to encourage publicly listed companies to distribute more cash dividends to their shareholders. The first is an additional 10% tax, which will be levied on amounts transferred to retained earnings and or reserves exceeding 70% of the company's net income after tax for that year. The original proposal was for the tax rate to be 15% and for the tax to apply if the retained earnings and reserves exceeded 50% of the company's paid up capital. And the second is a 10% tax which will be imposed on the full amount of stock dividends distributed by a company if the amount of such dividends exceeds the amount of cash dividends distributed by the company in that year. The original proposal was for a 15% tax rate. I have two cases from India. The first case is a decision of the Mumbai Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. The taxpayer is a US company which provided cloud hosting services to Indian customers. Importantly, the Indian customers had no control of the equipment which the US company used to provide the services. The Indian tax authorities claimed that the service fees were royalties under both the domestic law definition and the definition in Article 12.3 of the India-US Treaty and therefore withholding tax applied. Both of those definitions refer to payments for the use of or the right to use equipment but the Indian domestic law adds an explanation that in applying this test, possession or control of the equipment by the payer or the direct use of the equipment by the payer is not required. That explanation was introduced into the legislation in 2012, but with retrospective effect from 1976. The tax authorities sought to have that domestic law explanation applied in interpreting the definition in Article 12.3. The tribunal rejected that argument. We are of the view that the amendments in the domestic tax law cannot be read into the tax treaty as there is no change in the definition of royalties under the India-USA treaty. Therefore, the retrospective amendment in the royalty definition under the Act does not impact the definition of royalties in the India-USA tax treaty. That decision is in line with other tribunal decisions. And the tribunal concluded that the payments don't fall within the Article 12.3 definition due to the fact that the customers have no control over the equipment. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. The second case from India is a decision of the Cochin Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. The taxpayer is a resident of the UAE. The taxpayer sold units in an Indian equity-oriented mutual fund. In other words, a mutual fund where the underlying property is predominantly shares in Indian companies. In India, a mutual fund is in the form of a trust. The tax authorities claimed that Article 13 of the India-UAE Treaty permitted India to impose tax on the gain made by the taxpayer. Here are the relevant paragraphs in Article 13. The land rich paragraph, paragraph 3, did not apply, and so the case focused on paragraphs 4 and 5. Paragraph 4 refers to the alienation of shares in a company which is a resident of India. Paragraph 4 would allow Indian tax. And paragraph 5 refers to the alienation of any other property. 
Paragraph 5 gives the exclusive right to tax such gains to the residence country, the UAE. The tax authorities argued that paragraph 4 applied on the basis that units in an equity-oriented mutual fund are, in substance, shares in companies. The tribunal rejected that argument. It adopted this analysis. The term share is not defined in the treaty. Therefore, Article 3.2 allows the domestic law meaning of share to be used, unless the context otherwise requires, which it does not here. The Indian tax law does not have a definition of share. However, the Indian Companies Act defines share to mean a share in the share capital of a company and includes stock. And the Indian Companies Act defines company to mean a company incorporated under the Companies Act 2013 or under any previous company law. Under Indian regulations, mutual funds can be established only in the form of trusts and not companies. Therefore, units issued by Indian mutual funds will not be shares for the purposes of the Indian Companies Act. And under other Indian regulations, it is clear that shares and units in a mutual fund are two separate types of securities. And accordingly, for the purposes of Article 13, the term shares does not include units in a mutual fund. And therefore, the court concluded that paragraph 5 of Article 13 applies. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Indonesia, President Widodo has stated in an interview that he wants to make significant reforms to the country's economy to drive higher growth, including reducing the corporate income tax rate from 25% to 20%. This repeats various initiatives outlined in a government statement in June. And also in Indonesia, it's been reported that legislation is being prepared to impose VAT on inbound digital services and e-commerce sales of goods by foreign suppliers. In Belgium, the tax authorities have confirmed that the most favoured nation clause in regard to Article 12 of the Belgium-Lithuania Treaty has been triggered. This MFN clause is triggered if Lithuania enters into a treaty with an OECD member and the treaty provides for a lower source country tax rate on royalties, including nil, and or provides for a narrower definition of the term royalties. The new Japan-Lithuania Treaty, which is effective from the 1st of January 2019, does both. The definition is narrower and the treaty exempts royalties from source country tax. Those features now apply to the Belgium-Lithuania Treaty, effective the 1st of January 2019. Also in Belgium, the tax authorities have provided guidance in regard to the 12 months holding period in the dividends article, Article 10 of the Belgium-Switzerland Treaty. That 12 months holding period is described in Article 10 in this way. The beneficial owner of the dividends is a company which holds for an uninterrupted period of at least 12 months shares representing directly at least 10% of the capital of the company paying the dividends. If that 12 months holding period is satisfied, the dividends are exempt from source country tax. The Belgian guidance states that the 12 months holding period does not need to be satisfied at the time the dividends are paid, 
provided that the uninterrupted 12 months holding period is completed after the dividends are paid. In that situation, the guidance indicates that the Belgian company should withhold tax on the basis that the 12 months holding period will not be satisfied. If it is then subsequently satisfied, the tax should be paid to the Swiss shareholder. If the holding period is subsequently breached, the tax should be paid to the Belgian tax authorities. And now to the EU. It's been reported that 14 UK companies have filed appeals with the European General Court challenging the European Commission's decision that the group financing exemption in the UK's CFC rules was in part illegal state aid. The UK government has also filed an appeal. The European Court of Auditors has issued a report which concludes that EU member states and the European Commission are not addressing all of the challenges involved in collecting VAT and customs duties for goods and services which are traded on the internet. For a copy of the report and the related press release, please go to our website or app. In France, the DST bill, which has been passed by both Houses of Parliament, also contains an amendment to the corporate income tax rates for 2019. Under legislation passed in 2018, France will reduce its corporate income tax rate progressively from 33.33% in 2018 to 25% in 2022. As part of that program, the rate for 2019 was set at 31% for profits exceeding €500,000 and a lower rate of 28% for profits up to €500,000. Under the amendment in the DST bill, the 33.33% rate will be reinstated in 2019 for companies which have a turnover of 250 million euros or more, determined on a group basis. For such companies, the 33.33% rate will apply to their profits above 500,000 euros, with the profits below 500,000 euros being subject to the 28% rate. Accordingly, in 2019, there will be three corporate income tax rates. 28% for profits below €500,000. 31% for profits above €500,000 if the company and its group have a turnover of less than €250 million. Euros. And 33.33% for profits above €500,000 if the company and its group have a turnover of 250 million euros or more. In Germany, a government-appointed panel of economists has issued a report on climate policy. The report recommends that there be temporary carbon pricing in the transportation and building sectors until the EU emissions trading system is updated. For a copy of the report and a related press release, please go to our website or app. In Ireland, the government has issued a report on corporation tax. The report provides an update on Ireland's progress and plans to amend its law in regard to the BEPS project and EU directives. For a copy of the report, please go to our website or app. In the Netherlands, a bill to implement the EU Directive on Mandatory Disclosure of Potentially Aggressive Cross-Border Tax Planning Arrangements, commonly known as DAC6, has been introduced into the lower house of parliament. An earlier version of the bill was subject to public consultation six months ago. The current bill is closely aligned with the wording in the directive. 
EU member states are required to transpose the directive into national law by the 31st of December 2019 to be effective from the 1st of July 2020. In Slovenia, the tax authorities have announced that they plan to audit courier companies to determine whether the courier services performed for foreign e-commerce suppliers cause those suppliers to have a fixed establishment in Slovenia for VAT purposes. In Spain, the Court of Appeal has decided an interesting transfer pricing case. The taxpayer is a wholesale distributor. In its transfer pricing documentation, it applied the transactional net margin method with return on sales as the profit level indicator. Here are the relevant numbers. On the left, you'll see the numbers for the set of comparables. These are three-year numbers showing a lower quartile of 2.1% and an upper quartile of 7.6%. Also, you'll see that the median is 4.1% and the average is 6.1%. And also, you'll note that the numbers for the comparables relate to the years 2003 to 2005, whereas the tax years which were considered in the case were 2006 to 2008. That discrepancy was not an issue in the case. On the right, you'll see the taxpayer's numbers for the 2006 to 2008 years. Both 2006, 3.84 per cent, and 2008, 2.42 per cent, fall within the interquartile range of 2.1 per cent to 7.6 per cent. However, the return on sales for 2007, 0.42 per cent, falls below the interquartile range. There were two main issues in the case. The first was whether it was appropriate for the taxpayer's return on sales in 2007, 0.42%, to be compared with the set of comparables which reflects multiple year data, three years in this case. The taxpayer argued that if multiple year data should be used for the set of comparables, it should also be used for the taxpayer's return on sales. And therefore, the taxpayer's average return on sales over the 2006 to 2008 years, 2.22%, should be compared with the interquartile range. The court rejected that argument. It concluded that multiple year data should be used for the set of comparables but that should be compared with the taxpayer's numbers for each year in isolation, not an average of multiple years. The second issue concerns the transfer pricing adjustment which should be made for 2007. The taxpayer argued that the adjustment should be to the lower quartile, 2.1%. In contrast, the tax authorities argued that the adjustment should be made to the median, 4.1%. The court held that if the interquartile range comprises results of relatively equal and high reliability, any point in the interquartile range will satisfy the arm's length principle. However, if there are comparability defects, the median would be appropriate to use. The court said that in the present case, the tax authorities had not evidenced any comparability defects, and therefore the adjustment should be to the lower quartile, 2.1%. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Switzerland, the Supreme Court has decided a case in regard to the time limit for refund of dividend withholding tax. A Swiss company paid dividends to a French resident and, in accordance with domestic law, withheld 35% anticipatory tax from the gross dividends. 
Five years later, the French resident requested a refund of the excess Swiss tax over the 15% limit which is provided in the France-Switzerland Treaty. Under the Swiss domestic law, refund requests can be made only within three years after the dividend payment. The court held that as the treaty does not refer to any time limitation, the domestic law time limit must apply, and therefore the refund request was rejected. In the UK, the first tier tribunal has decided two VAT cases. The first case concerns a parent company which provided technical services to its subsidiaries. The service fees were not paid in cash, but were added to the subsidiary's intercompany loan balances. The tribunal held that the services were supplied for consideration, and therefore the parent company's services were an economic activity. The parent company was therefore entitled to input tax credits. The second case concerns the characterisation of a physical diary called an Action Day Planner. The issue was whether the Action Day Planner should be characterised as a book or as unused stationery. The tribunal held that it should be characterised as a book and therefore its supply was zero rated. An interesting aspect of this case is that the taxpayer is resident in Iceland. He is an Amazon marketplace trader and he makes sales of the Action Day Planner to customers in the UK through that platform. Also in the UK, the government has released for public consultation draft legislation to be included in the next finance bill. The public consultation period will run until the 5th of September. For the link to the government website, which contains all the relevant documents, please go to our website or app. And finally, in regard to the UK, the tax authorities have issued new rules concerning changes in accounting for VAT, following increases or reductions in the price of goods or services. The new rules are effective from the 1st of September 2019. For a copy of the new rules, please go to our website or app. In Nigeria, the Court of Appeal has decided a case in regard to a 2% surcharge which is levied on contract fees for relevant services performed by any vessel. Under the legislation, the definition of the term vessel requires that it be used for the carriage, that is transportation, of persons or property. The court held that a drilling rig, which was not used for transportation, does not satisfy that definition, and therefore the 2% surcharge does not apply. The Inter-American Centre of Tax Administrations has released a report called A Cocktail of Measures for the Control of Abusive Transfer Pricing Manipulation with a contextual focus on low-income and developing countries. The report is currently only in Spanish, but an English version will be available soon. For a copy of the report, please go to our website or app. In Brazil, there are some developments in regard to the initiative to simplify the country's complex indirect tax system. Firstly, the bill which was introduced into the Chamber of Deputies in April has now been referred to a special committee for a constitutional review. And secondly, a second bill has now been introduced into the Senate with the same objective and in a similar form as the first bill in the Chamber of Deputies. 
One notable difference between the two bills concerns the transition period. The Chamber of Deputies bills has a 10-year transition period, whereas the Senate bill has a 15-year transition period. In the US, the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit has decided a case involving a constitutional challenge to Article 26A of the Canada-US Double Tax Treaty. Article 26A gives the US authority to collect unpaid income taxes on behalf of Canada. A Canadian taxpayer who was a US citizen and resident argued that Article 26A breaches the US Constitution. Firstly, because it breaches the origination clause. It is effectively a bill for raising revenue, and the treaty did not originate in the House of Representatives. And secondly, because it breaches the taxing clause. According to the taxpayer, Congress has the exclusive right to enact tax legislation. The taxpayer also argued that the treaty is not self-executing and is therefore unenforceable because it has not been validated by the requisite implementing legislation. The court rejected all of the taxpayer's arguments. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. And speaking of treaties, the US Senate voted this week to ratify the four outstanding protocols with Japan, Luxembourg, Spain and Switzerland, despite Senator Paul's best efforts to frustrate the process. And also in the US, commentators are complaining about the complex and inconsistent documentation requirements under the proposed FIDI regulations in order to prove export status. One commentator suggested that some companies might choose to transfer their IP assets to a foreign subsidiary in order to fall outside the FIDI regime and into the guilty regime, which does not require any proof of export status. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had one treaty enter into force and one protocol enter into force. I have two articles for you this week. The first article is called The Wider Spanish Tax Exemption on Interest Through the Danish Filter. It's written by Antonio Barba de Alba and Diego Arabas, and it's published in Kluwer's International Tax Blog. This article considers the Danish joined cases which were decided by the European Court of Justice earlier this year. You'll remember that those cases involve the interpretation of the EU Parent Subsidiary Directive and the Interest and Royalties Directive. The article addresses this question. What impact do the court's judgments have on domestic legislation of EU member states, and in particular Spain, where that domestic legislation provides for a withholding tax exemption which is wider than in those two directives, and which was enacted years before the two directives were implemented. The article focuses on the Spanish interest withholding tax exemption and the IRD. The authors write this, the Spanish domestic withholding exemption on interest was drafted in broader terms than required 13 years later in the IRD. Three aspects can be highlighted. One, unlike the IRD, it does not require the recipient to take a particular form or to be subject and not exempt to a particular tax. 
Two, it applies to non-related EU lenders, while the IRD only provides exemption for interest paid to associated companies. Three, remarkably, and contrary to the IRD, the wording of the exemption does not require the recipient of the interest to be its beneficial owner. You'll remember that the court in the Danish joint cases considered two separate issues in regard to the IRD, beneficial ownership and an EU anti-abuse rule. The authors also consider each of these issues in turn. They write this. First question. Can the Spanish tax authorities oblige the recipient of the interest to be its beneficial owner in order to apply the domestic withholding tax exemption? In our opinion, the answer is no, because Spanish legislation lacks this requirement. Spain is free to enact more liberal rules and grant benefits that go beyond a directive and even to decide whether or not to levy a tax. And the beneficial ownership test is not a general principle of EU law that can apply even in the absence of transposition. And later they write this. This leads us to the second question. Is the IRD judgment by the ECJ irrelevant for the application of the Spanish GAR regarding the interest withholding exemption? In our view, the answer is again no, because of how the concept of abuse is developed by the ECJ in the Danish cases, which seems to be closely linked to the concept of abuse in the general anti-avoidance rule established in Article 6 of ATAD. The European GAR in ATAD is a minimum level of protection that EU member states must incorporate into their domestic legislation, meaning Spain is obliged to have GAR to be able to deny tax benefits to situations that would be considered fraudulent or abusive practices from an EU perspective. Therefore, the concept of abuse included in the Danish cases and the indicators of abuse developed by the ECJ could be relevant when considering whether abuse exists when applying the Spanish GAR to the domestic withholding exemption on interest. The second article is called The Importance of the Marco Polo Cases for Understanding the Application of the Brazilian Transfer Pricing Rules. It's written by Francisco Lisboa Moreira and Ana Paula Saunders, and it's also published in Kluwer's International Tax Blog. Given the current initiative to bridge the gap between Brazil's transfer pricing rules and the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, this article is a timely reminder of how rigid the current Brazilian rules are. The authors illustrate this by describing the two Marco Polo cases which were decided in 2008 and 2011 respectively. In both of those cases, the taxpayer used the CAP or cost plus method which is described by the authors in this way. The cap is available for export operations and is defined as the average acquisition cost of goods and services plus taxes and a fixed markup of 15%. The authors write this. Marco Polo is a Brazilian MNE, public traded company, that assembles bus bodies, chassis, in Brazil for exportation, which accounts for a significant share of the company's revenues. In 2005, the company was assessed for its offshore operation structures, as it used two offshore associated enterprises, Marco Polo International Corporation, MIC, incorporated in the British Virgin Islands, BVI, and Ilmot International Corporation, Ilmot, 
a company incorporated in Uruguay. Marco Polo shipped the production directly to the final customers, but used a re-invoicing structure to sell to the associated companies, MIC and Ilmot, using the CAP method, which then issued the final invoice to the end customers at market value. The Brazilian tax authorities understood that the two associated enterprises lacked substance, as the invoices were issued and signed by Marco Polo employees in Brazil. The employees providing services to the foreign companies were actually Marco Polo's employees, and the volume sold by MIC and Ilmot would be the same volume exported by Marco Polo to such customers. Nevertheless, in both cases, the court held that the tax authorities could not make a transfer pricing adjustment for the reason that Marco Polo had complied with the CAP method. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 19th of July, 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.